Welcome back to Real Talk, American Edition. In today's show, we are talking about the health crisis and the food industry here in America. In this part, part two, we are going to talk about the pharmaceuticals and the, uh, the concept of being too health conscious. So let's start off with uh, being too health conscious. Now, Bilal, in, in hospitals these days, from what I hear, we're seeing more and more people coming in for plastic surgeries. They want to look good, but at the same time, they, are they healthy? Um, they can be healthy. It depends on what the reason for plastic surgery is. So uh, there is cosmetic surgery and then there's reconstructive surgery, different things. A cosmetic surgery from an Islamic point of view is um, excessive barring reconstructive surgery. Uh, cosmetic surgery, I think, um, I mean, it's on the rise. Um, I'm not exactly sure what your question is. Was it, do I see it or do I believe in, do you, I agree with it? Yeah, are you seeing more of a rise of people trying to go for that quick fix? They'd rather, you know, they'd rather get the cosmetic surgery. They'd rather get their stomach stapled or uh, instead of exercising, for example. Okay, so, I th so you're talking about sort of uh, uh, endpoints uh, that are as a result of leading, leading a bad lifestyle or not being satisfied with whatever you're given. So yeah, we do see people who are after cosmetic surgeries, uh, liposuction, people who are wanting uh, bariatric surgery, which is basically uh, taking part of the stomach out and sewing it up so it's smaller and it fills faster. Uh, these are very uh, late stage measures that uh, people resort to when they're dissatisfied with their health. Absolutely, we see this. You know, to be uh, proactive is the key, you know, and one, uh, again, back to what Hippocrates said is use food as your medicine. And certain foods are what they call today probiotic, meaning it's pro-life, you know, from pro and bio meaning life. Um, interesting note is that antibiotics, you know, it, it has the exact, in its definition, sort of anti-life, and some people criticize that. I'm not criticizing all antibiotics, but you know, it's again, um, to be proactive, you would use probiotics like yogurt, um, fermented foods, apple cider vinegar is very good. So these are things that you incorporate into your life to prevent from getting certain types of sicknesses. With the issue of health, from an Islamic perspective, we should never think that you should be in a state of health at all times. Um, sin, according to the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is that it's an exemption of sins. And sometimes health is a trial. Now maybe it's a self-induced trial that you brought upon yourself, you know, and it takes on a form of uh, punishment too, perhaps if you have gone outside the bounds. But nevertheless, it's something that no one can avoid. But there's certain types of uh, sicknesses that can be avoided if you eat the right foods and you take steps in terms of uh, following the sunnah, particularly. Uh, so, so we have the organic, we have the food as the medicine. But you know, in today's society, we're also seeing other types of medicine. We're seeing this pharm pharmacology coming in with all these engineered products. Now, uh, Micah, is this, is this pure? Is this, as, as the Quran says, is this tayyib, all this, this genetically engineered pills? Well, I haven't come across, in my understanding, in the Quran of any verse that alludes to the, the, the magic and the, and, and the greatness of um, what man creates, you know. Um, but what I have noticed is that there's some things that are in a natural state that man doesn't have to interfere with or add to in any way that have been said to be a cure. Honey's one example, um, where the Quran says that in honey is a cure. Nothing has to be done to honey. It doesn't have to be um, heated or, or added to anything. And as far as I know, there hasn't been any antibodies or uh, vaccinations that have been made from honey. But still, God has given man knowledge to just explore the earth and to find mysteries and maybe treasures. So in that same breath, you know, when uh, I was reading recently that some of the early Muslims from Turkey had helped develop some of the first vaccines in terms of where you take a, a small, you know, at the time it might sound crazy, but if I said I was going to give you um, a disease, a small, a small amount of it, and infect you with it, that somehow that I would help you cure, you know, and now we know that that's a good idea. Now, to take it to another level, some people today might look at homeopathy as something bizarre and crazy, but it actually works on the same principle. You take a, a small amount, it's so small that they say, well, it doesn't even exist, but you're still uh, introducing it into your spirit, you know, meaning it helps you heal. So, 
As far as, you know, from a Quranic perspective, I would say that there seems to be more emphasis on things in the natural state as opposed to what man can create in, say, the drug companies and these type of things. Not to say that there's not any good in it, but, you know, I, 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 my personal leaning is more towards the health of the natural state of things. Um, and again, um, the modern research on honey is always there, but it's not mainstream. If people knew, you know, there's people in, uh, studies have been done in Europe that have shown that honey is uh, like 99% effective against staph infections. A lot of people that go to hospitals who get sick or whatever, it actually ends up being a result of something else, a staph infection, which wasn't what they went in for. So when they have these, um, uh, food as medicine is, is endorsed, and there's a, a book um, about, uh, several books about the Holy Prophet, Salam, where he mentioned all types of herbs, foods, uh, vegetables, medicine, and what they're good for and how they've been applied throughout ages. And this actually uh, gets reinforced when you look at tradi other traditional cultures where they didn't have some of the chronic diseases we have today. There was a man uh, who you really should do some research on named Weston A. Price. And this man actually traveled um, during the early 1900s uh, all over the world. He was a dentist by trade, but what he focused on was nutrition. And what he noticed is that when he went to these traditional societies where they had yet to start eating the modern, the modern food, there was a, uh, an absence of a lot of these chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, cancer. It was almost completely non-existent. He went to the Native Americans, he went to Australian Aborigines, he went to certain regions of Europe where people were in the mountains, and he noticed that the, the foods they ate were just local foods. And just by eating that, they had prevented most of the diseases that they inherently saw in the, in the cities where the modern food was being processed. Now, they even noticed it in a family line where, uh, take for instance, you have a Native American family where the oldest brother and sister's picture of health. But somewhere in that time frame where they had the, the younger kids, the modern food came in. The first thing he noticed is that they had dental problems, you know, the dental stuff. And then there are a host of other things set in. So if when we recognize that food is causing disease, then the cure is like food is also as, disease, uh, as a cure. Okay, so, so. Uh, so going to the audience. Now, okay, so we've had pharmaceuticals as medicine, we've had food as medicine, but apparently more people are using drugs as their medicine. Is, is it due to some sort of corporatization of the market? Is there some sort of corporate greed going on? Yes, Osman. More on spirituality and food. Um, you know, Promise of Salah Salam has written, Essence of Islam, I believe I'm just paraphrasing here, but a balanced diet or a variety of meats helps you spiritually. I just want to know, Micah, could you comment on is there anything in your research that you found that specifically helps our spirituality? Is it like eat a lot of broccoli or anything that you've come across that you could touch well, base on? I, I think a lot of it has to do with balance. And I think a lot of it has to do with eating those foods in a natural state. To, to try to go really deep on some, some thoughts of uh, some of the writings of, of Mr. Gula Ahmed alayhi salam, um, is that he spoke about behind the, the physical, there's the spiritual. You know, homeopathy, uh, the fourth Khalifa also mentioned that everything has a spiritual signature. So when you're eating the food, there's also an element that's on another plane, you know, uh, energy, if you want to call it. Um, so in the process of that, when you eat a food uh, in its natural state, you're getting it as a lot intended the physical and also perhaps the spiritual part of it. Um, we know from even the traditions of um, the Holy Prophet Salaam, that plants have uh, um, a spirit, not like ours, but they have a spirit. And it's been recorded that there was um, communication sometimes of the saints with plants and that there is a, a like you could say, an angel attached to them. This is in the works of uh, Essence of Islam, if you check it out. So. With that, you know, the connection to, to spirit is if we disrupt it by processing it, it's just a, a theory that it cannot be proved scientifically, but that you might be um, disconnecting from that connection. So I would say all foods, you know, but particularly the Quran mentions 
certain foods that I think are more beneficial for man than others. Milk in its natural state, honey in its natural state, certain things to avoid spiritually, like the pig. Now we all know we're not supposed to eat swine, and we had this conversation earlier that if you had a pig that you could eliminate the worms that are in it, if you fed it healthy food, if you raised it generation after generation in a hygienic environment, would it make the Quran any less applicable to say that, that, that Allah had declared that a foul animal? In the very essence of the word, kinzer for the pig is it's a foul animal. So there's something in its spirit related to us that perhaps we shouldn't have because it'll have an effect spiritually on us. Now, one of the things you mentioned is disruptions with the, with the soul. One of those biggest disruptions in our, in our day-to-day life is our sleep. And our sleep patterns are always affected. Now, Salim, uh, you have a book out there about energy. Uh, it's called Seven Secrets of Highly Energetic People. Now, how does, how does sleep play a factor in, in all of this? Sleep is vital. Um, you know, just as there's a, um, a health crisis, there's a human energy crisis, um, there's a sleep crisis. We've forgotten how to sleep, basically. Um, sleep is important. That's how we rejuvenate. You know, it's how we actually regenerate as well. We actually produce more human growth hormone, which is anti-aging, when we're well rested you know, in, in our sleep. But it's also important to get a certain amount of, of sleep, but at the right times. What I mean by the right times is today, because of our technology and the 24 hours, you know, 365, we're disconnected with cycles of nature, right? In the, the ancients, not even necessarily the ancients, but just go back 200 years, 300 years ago, or pre-electricity, you know, we went to sleep within two hours after sunset. You know, and if you practice that, try to find, it's really difficult to do today, I understand that. But if we try to start implementing techniques that we used, you know, two or three hundred years ago, you know, we're going to see a vast improvement and it's going to be quick, it's going to be all natural in our health, right? But sleep is vital for obesity, you know, sleep is vital for emotional health, spiritual health, you, you name it, anything you, you want to look at. Um, it's, it's how we rejuvenate and it's so important to, to have that. Now, Bilal, your job is to put people to sleep, and hopefully they wake up. Do you see some people perhaps growing dependent on the anesthesia that you give them, and, uh, or do you actually have to see people getting the, the Ambien and the other sleep medications? Yeah, the second thing we see a lot, the, uh, the addiction to anesthetics and narcotics is another problem, and maybe a different discussion, but as a society, we've become dependent on AIDS for sleep because in large part because, as you've been articulating so well, that our lifestyle prohibits us to have a sort of natural pattern. And this is a real serious issue because the very architecture of our society is rigged to destroy any kind of natural pattern. We're expected to take work um, home, to work at home. Um, sometimes mothers are taken outside of the house and having to work at home, which you know, translates into other issues because they're not home cooking anymore. So the mother's not at home cooking, perhaps because they have to work, and then you end up having to pop in something to the microwave and have fast food at home. So um, back to your question about sleep, I think it's very crucial. Uh, physicians here in uh, the United States kind of recommend six to eight hours. Uh, I have noticed that um, uh, needs and requirements for sleep do vary quite a bit, individual to individual. Um, so you need to kind of proceed with wisdom with that. Yeah, from the, from the audience, any comments on, on the sleep patterns? And uh, yeah, Donish. I just had a little question uh, regarding the sleep. Um, just, just uh, you know, maybe some advice regarding uh, sleep. Uh, somebody who's maybe, you know, somewhat normal, healthy, um, maybe in their mid-20s, you know, a lot of people in the finance industry, they're working long hours. And you know everybody's you know taking five hour energy and Red Bulls and monsters. Um, can they be put? Can they possibly see long term, you know, damage if they're you know getting four to six hours of sleep, you know, daily even for a few years? Can they be harming their future in any way? Yeah, absolutely. Because what you do tonight, your your choices actually your choices today, are going to affect you tomorrow. Right? Based on what you just had for dinner is going to affect how you wake up and feel tomorrow. So if you've got Red Bull in your system that's keeping you awake because you've only had you know, four hours of sleep, or four hours, right, you said, right? Four to six, four to six hours of sleep. Um, the long-term effects are, is the way this works is, if you're on that cycle of four hours of sleep, there's something you're doing in the next day to get, wake you up. 
to give you the energy and the vitality that you need, right? So you're complementing that need with, you know, caffeinated drinks, uh, sugary foods, um, you know, other, other forms of stimulation. Light is a stimulant. Right, so if we're on our laptops, I, I worked in the IT field so I can relate to this. I'm on my laptop VPN'd in on, on my network two o'clock in the morning checking my, my network to make sure everything is up and running. That light stimulation has an effect on our eyes, on our retinas, and that signaling goes back to our brain. It literally has our brain thinking we're still in daytime hours. So I, right? from what I've read, you shouldn't even be around electronics in perhaps the last half hour of when you're supposed to go to sleep. So now that we've, you know, we've reached the conclusion of the show, a terrific show, uh, from our panelists, uh, you know, Bilal, starting with Bilal, uh, just a quick, quick uh, wrap up, closing thought on, on the whole issue of the health crisis of the food industry. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, uh, globally speaking, you know, the, obviously the country's in a state of turmoil in terms of health, health crisis and access, real important. Uh, but I guess what I think the perspective we need to have in mind is that, um, Health industries come and go, governments come and go, uh, politics, all this comes and goes. What uh, stays is uh, basically the essential principles taught to us by Islam. And uh, the Holy Prophet said something wonderful, just really elegantly he said that, I only eat when I'm hungry and I stop eating when I'm actually still hungry. And because of this, I rarely need to see a physician. This beautiful message, and I think it reminds us that the the body uh, needs to stay pure in order for the st soul to stay pure. Salim? Yeah, I mean, I, I very well said. Um, I think you know we are in a state of crisis, and, and, and there's a, so many elements that uh, that make it that way. Um, the the last thing I think I probably want to leave have you guys left with is really the big thing that we need to do is to express ourselves. You know, share that you want, you know, a healthier lifestyle for yourself, for your family, for your generation. Share that in your community today. Share that with your politicians. Call them up. Um, share that with your wallet. Vote, vote with your wallet with the choices that you make. You know, whether if it's the healthier fast food options or the CSAs or the community supports agriculture environments and things like that. Um, but say something. But at the very underlying thing, if you're about to go ahead and take on a health initiative, as I like to call it, get yourself into a support system where someone is gonna be a stand for your goals and what you wanna achieve, because having that underlying support is gonna be really, really key and fundamental. Support is key, and Micah. Um, health, your health is in your hands, but even more so, it's in Allah's hands. So never underestimate the power of prayer. And to be proactive, the prayer, Rabbi Zidni Ilma, O oh Allah, bless me with knowledge, is your step to higher understanding for yourself and your family. And I want to say Jazakla to my panelists, to this very esteemed audience. And today we heard a lot of great discussion from these panelists and the audience. But don't forget, you can add to the conversation as well on our website, www.mta.tv slash realtalk. You can email us directly at realtalk at mta.tv. Or you can follow us on Twitter for the latest updates and news. And if we all do a little something, we can all have a lot of change. That's all the time we have for these real issues, real views, and real stories. This was Real Talk. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>